Hello, in video 16 I want to talk about how we can create robust programs, which is our goal, using validation and also exception handling. If we did a basic quiz like something like what is um, 20 divided by 5, we can then check this input by the user. So if we do something like if answer equals equals uh, 20 divided by 5, it's always a good idea to not hard code it because we can always change it later and need to make sure this is converted to an integer because we can't really compare, well, we can't compare a string to an integer like that. Uh, and then I can print correct if they are correct, otherwise we can print incorrect. So let's see how this works. It's a fairly standard program, 20 divided by five is four, press enter, I get correct. If I type in the wrong answer, if I type in five, I get incorrect. Lovely, so really, really simple program in how many lines of code if I get rid of the white space. Uh, we have five lines of code, really simple. The issue is, this program is not very robust. So if something is robust, it's strong, it can't be easily broken. So really the opposite word to robust is weak. This program currently is quite weak because if I, you know, don't type in a number, if I type in G, press enter, we get a value error because it's expecting here in line two to be able to cast my input to an integer but it can't cast g to an integer and so it has an error. Likewise if I uh, maybe, well let's maybe edit this code so that instead of actually hard coding it completely we have maybe uh, number a, uh, number a, um, a is a variable and we can have 20 in this one and we can have b representing five and now if I change uh, this so we're now doing a divided by b and maybe we let the user in fact let's let the user input these two okay so now I've just changed it so it's um I can better show this so now we're getting views to actually enter two numbers so I can do 20 and then 5 and then what is 20 divided by 5 well it's 4 so that works fine but if I start to maybe either deliberately or by mistake get this wrong so we 20 divided by 5 but what happens if I, well, like I did before, do G, we get another, what's well, the same error we had before. But now if I do my first number 20 and my second number zero, and then 20 divided by zero, you might think, well, is that 20? But actually we can't divide by zero at all. In maths, it just doesn't make sense to divide by zero because we don't get, it doesn't make sense. It would be, uh, you, how many times does zero go into 20? Well, who knows? So here we get a different error. We say we get a division by zero error, which is fairly common in programming, usually not doing a really kind of obvious example like this. It usually happens by mistake if you've got um, user input in particular, but if you've got your denominator changing um, over time, especially based on input, then there is definitely a risk of having a divide by zero error, which can be a big issue. So this program is definitely not robust, it is a weak program, because we can break it by you know, just typing in slightly wrong input and it breaks our program, it stops running, which is a big problem. This could, in some cases, lead to a security issue in that perhaps your security breaks when you put in a certain input, uh, but also it could just you know stops your program working which you don't want and when you are programming you should always be assuming that your end user is either a complete moron and doesn't understand what's going on and can't follow instructions or is trying to deliberately break or gain access to your program without permission in other words assume they are stupid or malicious and this means we need to program in a defensive way we are sort of expecting attack and so we're going to program in defensive way to try and keep our program working and keep it working securely I think before we move on, it's worth just going through the three types of error. So we have uh, logic, uh, we have, let's do syntax errors first. Syntax errors we've come across a lot, usually by me uh, mistakenly typing something, because the syntax is the rules of the language. And so if you break those, the computer can't understand it. And so nothing really happens. If I get rid of one of these equal signs, so instead of a, a double equal sign to compare, we are kind of trying to assign it in an if statement, doesn't make sense. And so it gives us a syntax error. So the top of my code is working fine, but because it's sort of checking the code before it runs it, uh, nothing happens, we just get the error shown to us. So at least it's telling us where the error is, which is quite helpful, that's Replit doing that for us. But a logic error is harder because a logic error is working normally in the sense that your code will run. So if I fix this and maybe uh, change into float, because I wanna change this division to be floor divisions, so maybe you don't really know how to divide with real division, so you do two equal signs, uh, two um, forward slashes, 
and so your code will run but maybe not exactly uh, maybe not exactly how you expect it to I didn't uh, end off my uh, comment there so it's running fine but it won't work exactly how we want it to so maybe our first number is 20 uh, in fact let's do that again let's say our first number is 25 because then we can get a nice divide 25 divided by 2 you might think that's going to be 12.5 but actually um, that's incorrect which doesn't really make sense so you might be looking at that thinking well why is that wrong and it's because you've got this floor division because the computer is uh, taking that to be 12 not 12.5 because of this operation so you haven't quite understood it it's working but it's not as you intended to and our third error is a runtime error and this is a massive category of errors really any error which occurs as you're going anything which stops your program as you go so uh, this could be something like you get stuck in an infinite loop because you've written a while loop uh, wrongly your condition never becomes false maybe your computer runs out of memory which you haven't really got much control over as a programmer unless it's you that's caused that issue maybe you've clogged loads of memory somehow um, so some things we can't predict but also we sort of have within, within this category we have what we might call exceptions and exceptions are errors which happen during execution so the zero, the divide by zero error we had before, um, that was an example of an, an exception. And when we tried this, we did 20 divided by zero, um, this is zero uh, we get this, what is an error, but really would call an exception. It's stopping our program, you can see we're terminating our program, so it's not good, but really we can handle these. We, an exception like this shouldn't cause our program to terminate. So we can make it more robust by handling this exception. And we can do this and make our code more defensive by surrounding any sort of potentially problematic code in a try catch block. So we have a try clause. The try clause is a bit like a sort of a safe area the code can run in and it's not going to cause any issues, right? It's going to try the code. If it doesn't work, then that's fine. And to catch any issues, so if we have got an exception being raised, we can accept it and in this accept clause is where we can print you know there's been an error so instead of we instead of this error message we can sort of control this ourselves so i can print error so let's try this again and uh first number is 20 i mean let's try zero and so we get error instead of the big error message and that means that it doesn't actually look any different here but we we could continue our program without uh, it terminating prematurely because of the exception so we get hello printed out here, which is below where the sort of erroneous code was. And so we can sort of continue with our lives without having been derailed by what is really a minor error. Now, you do sometimes see people try and surround their entire code with a try clause, which is unnecessary and it is not a good idea because really you want to be using exception handling when you know there is a potential error coming. Like it's not just just in case like you've got some error in mind so if you're doing division you should know already that you can't divide by zero and so you might want to keep that in mind um, and usually you can you know rewrite this so that you're not using try at all so if you rewrite your condition in a slightly more uh, sophisticated way you can avoid this altogether right if you do float equals equals answer and is not zero then you can continue so you can usually rewrite conditions to prevent this happening but it is useful and generally speaking so rely so based you know uh, similar to how i said you shouldn't really surround your entire code with a try clause you shouldn't really have accept on its own you should kind of try and link this to a particular exception so instead you could do accept and follow this with a what is called a zero division error and now instead of this we could have a slightly less generic message we could say uh, don't <laughs> divide by zero because it's undefined so now we get a more specific message and we're not just catching any old error uh, which is not always wanted sometimes it is okay to have errors because you want to know what's what's gone wrong um, so it's more specific you can, you can have lots of accept clauses each for different errors it's a bit like if and elif and then you can have an accept as sort of your equivalent of else so any other exception you could do just a generic error message but it is a good idea to keep it as specific as you can now i want to talk about validation which isn't always going to lead to more robust programs it sort of depends on what you are validating because validation is there to make sure any input is meeting your criteria and in some cases the input being invalid is going to cause issues is going to cause errors like we saw before 
we had invalid input of a zero denominator which caused a divide by zero exception. So it, it can uh, make your program more robust and it certainly makes your program more usable and makes things easier for yourself as a programmer too. Because as I say, the user is uh, often gonna put in wrong inputs. So here we've got a fairly contrived start of some authentication program with some maybe security questions. Authentication being checking someone is who they say they are. And so maybe here we've got multi-factor authentication, asking some details about them, you're gonna even check those details. So maybe first of all, our requirement for the middle name is maybe what we would call a length check. A length check, maybe we want it to be more than two characters. I don't know many middle names or any names which are less than two characters. I'm sure there are probably some, but um, just as an example. And maybe for passcode, if you want it to be four digits, we just want it between, so we just want a range check between zero and um, uh, 9,999. And for the current date, we just want it to be a specific value, which is today's date. And because really here we have three conditions, we're going to want to validate using a while loop. And we have, I'm sure, done bits of validation before, but we can, we'll bring an exception handling in a second. Just for middle name, first of all, so we want the middle name, um, the length of this, so we wrap it in the length built-in function. And we want this to be greater than two. So in other words, less than or equal to two, then we can, um, we are going to just ask the user to input it again. Maybe you tell them as well that actually it should be uh, greater than two characters. Let's check this. First of all, what's your middle name? If I just do A, we get must be three more characters. What's your middle name? Do A again. It's gonna keep repeating until we enter a valid middle name. So my middle name is John uh, and we move on. In terms of our passcode, we want it to be within our four digit range. And so I've just created a condition here in a while loop that if it's less than zero or greater than 9,999, we're gonna just ask again for the passcode. Now the issue is, if I do something like 65, that is within our range, but isn't really appropriate. And so we shouldn't really want this to be accepted either. And so what we can do, I guess, add another or condition to this. If you say or the length of our passcode, is greater is a uh, less or not just not equal to four we also want that to be checked again the issue here is passcode is now an integer which because i've cast it up here and so we can't use len with an integer so if i just cast this back to a string getting quite messy uh let's make sure i've got enough brackets but uh it should sort of fix that issue and a lot of validation is trying to try things out and see what happens because really if you are assuming your user is going to be perfect, you're going to be tempted to only type in things which work. So you'll type in, you know, uh, 5000 is a valid passcode. And so you might be tempted just to try this, except that doesn't work um, because I didn't cast the second version, but you might assume it's working fine, even if it's not. So it's important to try your code with erroneous data. So data which you or input, which is wrong to see what happens. So that should actually work now. I fixed that mistake, but it should actually be an integer. But let's say we don't actually care how long this passcode is, we just want it to be a number. Well, this is a good case for using exception handling because all user input is a string, but as soon as we try and convert it to an integer, we may have an exception, right? Because if it's not an integer, then um, we're going to have an exception which we can handle. So maybe if I just copy this um, and show you this. So if I, if I try this, right? And if my passcode is ABC and not a number, we get this value error. So instead, based on what we've looked at before, we can wrap this in a try clause and then have an exception, an accept clause, but we want accept value error in this case, like so. Then we can have it must be a, an integer uh, to work. And so uh, we, it's not really an integer, right? Cause it's four digits or multiple digits. But anyway, um, the issue with this is, right? If I, now what's your passcode? I do ABC again. At least we have no error. So our program keeps working, but it's not really done anything, right? It's just said it must be an integer. We're not asked to then correct it. So what we could do, we could wrap this in a while loop using maybe a condition uh, is valid. So is valid is false initially. And while is valid, equals equals false, we're going to keep looping. And now if I just shift this across, we could add in an else clause. So else can be used in a few different cases, right? Usually we're just if, uh, and also you can use it with while loops. 
but here it can be used to supplement your tri clause because what happens is if it goes through the tri clause of no issues it will then go to the else clause so here I can set is valid to be true because we've managed to go through it without any issues except never gets run in that case except only ever gets executed if we have an exception which matches the actual uh, name specified here so now if I try this we should or your passcode if I do ABC we should now be asked again and again so we keep going through this process until I enter a valid passcode of course you may want further validation to this there is actually another clause we can use called finally which is used mostly for cleaning up especially if you're opening files and then want to close files uh, which we don't really want to do we'll use, we'll use with instead uh, here it will just get run whatever you're doing so if I just print hello we will see if we have an exception or no exception this code will get run uh, so if I do ABC we'll get hello if I do a proper 165 we also get hello so finally is run whatever you're doing if you have an exception or not else is only if we have no exception and for our final security question we just want a specific value we want today's date well to do this um, for the computer to know what today's date is we have to use another module which is really why I'm showing this quickly because it's quite useful uh, so the import uh, time module so the time module has got loads and loads and loads of methods we can use and so it will take me ages to explain all of them which I won't do um, and lots of them are really specific make sure time the import statement is right at the top by the way um, and so we can then use it down here so maybe I have another variable called actual date and I want to set this to um, the actual date which will calculate using a, a module within a method within time and to get this you can do time dot local time which will get you the current time but in a slightly weird format if I just comment out if I comment out some of our code up here just to make things a bit quicker using multi-line comments and try this out uh, in fact I need to actually print this otherwise it's not going to be very helpful to us um, we will get sort of a slightly weird format for this today's date five. Uh, so this is our format of our current time so we have sort of different components here you can see year 2020 uh, month 5 it's currently May and we get all of the features which is working out for us but actually we want to be able to format this in a slightly better way and so what we can do we can package this in a another using another method which is time dot SDR then F and then time for string formatting I believe and then our first argument is how we want this to be formatted and this will be as a string but we can use formatting codes so the percent sign is representing some other value here so if I do percent %d for day then I want this to be a, a, a slash then I want to do percent %m and then I want to do percent uh, capital Y for year I forgot for percent and in my second argument I'm going to then use the actual date in its previous version in that sort of tuple. Right, so now this will get us, if I print this again, I almost forget to print it, we should get a slightly nicer formatting of this. Then we can compare this against the user entering it. As so we get the correct date, I can verify this is true. And now we can compare this against the user. So I'm not sure you actually need a capital Y there. I don't think you do actually. Um, I'm not sure why I did, but it's fine. So what's happening is it's just replacing percent %d, percent %m and percent %y with the corresponding values in the, uh, the values found by the local time method. So we can now compare this. So I run this and it asks me for today's date. If I get this one wrong, if I do the 18th of May 20, it's incorrect. What's today's date? Well, if I do the 17th of May 20, then I can move on and it's validated. Not particularly relevant for creating robust programs, but just while we're looking at the time module, if you want to time your entire program as in see how long it takes to execute from start to end or a uh, position of your choice, we can use the time uh, method within the time module to do this. So this will record the time right now. And then at the end, if I do the exact same thing, and let's do it right at the end, and do end equals time dot time, I can then work out the elapsed time in between by uh, subtracting the start from the end and I can print this as well. So you can see how long it takes. But you can also, if you want to pause for a certain amount of time, maybe for dramatic effect, you can do time.sleep and sleep for however many se seconds you want, maybe five seconds. So let's see what happens. I could do uh, print sleeping just to see when it's starting, like so. And let's see what happens here. So if I just sort of go through this fairly languidly Incorrect, we'll say date. Well, let's do the 17th of May 20. Now, correct, it's now sleeping for what should be five seconds, and then we'll have a look at how long this will take. 
So it took 6.924 seconds, and obviously you'd probably round this if you uh, wanted to have it shown to the user. For this try now, once you pause this video, have a look at this block of code and try and predict what these three inputs would result in. There'll be answers in the description. And for question two, I want you to create a sort of password generator, which just takes two user inputs, uh, first of all, a number between 1 and 10, and then their favourite colour, which is, needs to be between 2 and 10 characters, and so you'll need to validate both of this input. And then I want you to write a function which is going to take in both of those inputs as parameters, and then return a password of the format, the number, followed by the colour, which has been converted to capital letters, followed by the year, which needs to be generated inside the function using the time module.